as you know, probably from the wailing and weeping of the audience last night, I was absent due to uh, internet connectivity issues. Surely not a sign of the worsening apocalypse. Uh, but I'm back tonight uh, with Tom and with Robert and with Carson and our very, very special guest, Larry Houston. And we're going to talk to Larry. We're, we're going to try to shut up for once during the show and, and really let him uh, tell us all about what, what it was like to work on G.I. Joe. Before we get to that, before we just turn the whole show over, guys, I was not here. And as an experienced podcaster, and let's face it, everyone's favorite here. Uh, I do have some notes. I just want to I want to run by some notes and maybe we can, you know, evaluate your performance last night and see if we can get this to a better place. Tom, I know I'm constantly wishing that you would go to a better place. So uh, some of these notes are about last night's episode. So this will also serve as a recap. Uh, please just let me get through and, and we'll 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 get this done with and we'll write you up for uh, disciplinary actions later. Uh, <laughs> Why do we never talk about Doc's glasses? They're weirdly green. Is he a weird green lantern? Does he get his glasses at the same place as the Baroness? She also has weird green glasses. Uh, Destro is very confident about the fact that they only need two more elements. That's two out of three. Mm, the math doesn't pan out, Destro. Uh, the tube worms <laughs> sound like an experimental power noise band your uh, cousin's roommate is in, and you wish you had listened to their tracks online before you agreed to come to the show. They're terrifying, the tube worms. Uh, I could write six issues right now on why everyone is so happy to see Torpedo. Uh, I don't think it would be a story for all ages, but it was kind of like Bill Murray showing up at your barbecue. Everybody's like, Torpedo, I want to hear that story. Uh, is, is the bear that Snake Eyes fought, is he an hallucination? He's very jacked. Yes. Is there a hallucination bear gym nearby? I have a lot of questions. Uh, Tom, Tom Feaster. Tom Elizabeth Feaster. Listen to me. Gene Wilder was in Blazing Saddles, not Gene Hackman. <laughs> oh, I misspoke. Yes, you I, I meant, surely did. I meant Young Frankenstein. You said Young Frankenstein, but you said Gene, uh, Gene Hackman. You're getting written yes, up Gene, for this. Gene uh, Hackman was in Young Frankenstein. No, Gene Wilder was in Young Frankenstein. No, Gene Hackman was the uh -oh. old blind man in Young Frankenstein. Damn it! You win this round, ah. Feaster. <laughs> Boom! Boom! <laughs> Fine. I had my I had my gene sequencing incorrect. Uh, look, what, Cover what Girl has time. one. Yeah. Look, Cover Girl has one job in this lousy cartoon. It's stupid, and she's gonna do it. Okay. Uh, uh, this is for you, Carson. You said this with your human mouth yesterday. Uh oh. <laughs> if I could see his backpack, I could tell. Listen to yourself. You were trying to identify short fuse, and what you said was, if I could see his backpack, I identified by him recognizing short fuse. I can't hear the <laughs> dialogue. On, <laughs> I can't Are hear you the a dialogue. backpack collector? Come on. Come on. Uh, uh, Duke did not sit in that chair. He was captured by it. Uh, <laughs> if the cartoon was made today, Snake Eyes would have one line of dialogue when he introduced Timber, and that line would be, he's a rescue. Uh, also, Snake Eyes, Snake Eyes would be voiced by Kristen Bell. She's a national treasure, but it's a bad fit. Uh, and finally, the episode ends with Duke captured by fumes. I don't know. Uh, I'll tell a story about Peter Mayhew to go with your uh, Luke Skywalker story from Dragon Con later. Uh, but I want to I talk about our guest, Chad Bowers, your guest, uh, who kept trying to be very nice and not interrupt and therefore only got to say like seven things. Uh, he's a wonderful guy, and you should have let him talk more, you insensitive creeps. Uh, but two things. He correctly called out my favorite moment in the movie credits of the G.I. Joe movie, which is when Snake Eyes flips the trouble bubble mm -hmm. and uh, zooms towards the screen. Uh, and I believe he asked a question that, that got kind of lost. Torpedo is named for artist Steve Lealoha on the file card. And if you don't know the name Steve Lealoha, Google him, and you will be happy and learn things. And, and it finally, Tom... Spring. It all circles um, back to Larry Houston. Larry, you storyboarded which, the yes. movie, didn't you? The movie yes, intro yes. in the first 10 minutes. Yep. Uh, yep, that was me. Uh, at the time when they were putting, putting together the uh, movie, um, Hasbro decided they needed an introduction. And there were three of us directors sitting at the office. And they said, oh, come up with something. So we all kind of went out on our own and just started making up stuff. And... About that time, uh, the Statue of Liberty was having some sort of um, anniversary back then. So I just keyed off that and then just started 
making up images and what could happen. I started making up a storyline and started mm -hmm. adding images and stuff like that. And it, it just kind of wrote itself. I just kept drawing stuff and it eventually I came up with the intro that you guys saw. And the intro, I think, was about two or three minutes long. So I was just drawing and storyboarding and just letting my imagination flow. And I was trying to also showcase every G.I. Joe I could think of at the same time. And so a lot of the, uh, the intro was like, uh, it wasn't conscious thinking. It was kind of like, I was kind of letting it write itself. Every time I drew an image, a new image would come up, come up in my imagination. I just start drawing and start making it up. And eventually when it got to the end, I turned it into Hasbro. They, they, my other two directors had their version of, of what they wanted, but Hasbro went with mine. And so that's the one you guys saw. Uh, I, I have to say, yep. it, it's um, it's a towering achievement of animation. I mean, it is absolutely stunning. Um, I mean, it's 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 something that we still watch in awe. It's just mm -hmm. gorgeous. It's just did, now. I have to ask: Do you still own that sequence? Do you have copies of that? Just as an educational tool, uh, does that exist somewhere? It probably does because I'm a pack rat, but I have a storage unit and it's probably stuck in there in the bottom somewhere. I mean, it's like, what, 30, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. Sure. I'm going to clean it out, you know, she's saying, why are we paying for this thing? And I'm like, well, I'll, I'll get to it there. I'll, I'll get to it. You know, Larry, um, those are priceless artifacts. Please just don't, don't ever yeah. throw them away. There are hundreds. We are legion. Like, your fans that would love – to, to own this, so just, just don't ever throw it out. Please, please, please. please. Okay. They, yeah, they I, really I, I, are, I don't, they, they really are an important artifact of American animation. It, it's it's mm -hmm. just an amazing sequence. Back back when I was doing, because uh, I also worked on the, um, the, uh, the series, the 65 episode series, and I worked on the, uh, uh, the mini series, both of them with, you know, the, the mass device and, and the dominator. Um, when I was, when I would direct a show, um, because I knew we were dealing with overseas and they didn't have a big budget, I would usually storyboard a director show and I, I would just draw everything with, the, I'd put it in the kitchen sink, basically. I'd try and put in everything I thought I needed. And usually what you got back was maybe at best 50% because of the budget. You know, I didn't know what the budgets were that they had to deal with overseas. Mm -hmm. What impressed me a lot was that when I got the intro for the G.I. Joe movie, was everything I put into the show, they actually animated I mean, because I filled up the scene with all the balloons and stuff, mm -hmm. the background that were happening. I never thought they would actually animate it all, but they did. And it was like, I was like stunned when I saw the first <laughs> take over. I was going, holy shit, this, <laughs> they did everything. Yeah. And, and the, the other thing about it is that by, by coincidence, when I did the, when I put together the animation, I had no music. All of that, they, the music came in afterwards, and they, they, it all blended in together really well. Yeah. And um, I was totally impressed by it. I was like, that's like one of the best, for me, it's like, as a director, it's like one of the best things I've ever uh, storyboarded, because it actually came out really close to what I saw in my imagination. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I yeah. very, very clearly remember saying, and Larry, this is before I knew that you were solely responsible for brainstorming, drawing, and, you know, directing that entire sequence, was that that is the single best few minutes of G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero animation from the entire series. All of it. Agreed. And, and I'm not... Yeah, yeah. I'm not a movie apologist. I don't love Cobra Law. I know that came from the advertising agency. That was a departure from the military yeah. stuff that I love. Blah, 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 blah. That opening sequence was the most detailed, most energetic, most kinetic piece of G.I. Joe animation from the entire run. And to Tom's point, it is a towering achievement. When I compare it to other animation, it is it's just amazing. Like you're, you're ahead of your class. You're, you're a brilliant talent. And thank you for spending time yeah. with us lovable losers that are just fans of your work. <laughs> So, so if I could ask, uh, if I could ask, what uh, what shows were you watching? What films were you watching? What what were the things that caught your imagination uh, around the time that you were storyboarding that, uh, and also prior to that? Where you know where did you train? Those kind of things. Uh, my background basically, I started in animation like 1980, and my influences at at the time were, uh, anime was just starting to come into into America. <clears throat> 
and my friends and I, at, we were working at Filmation. We were buying these like gigantic, you know, Domino Pizza laser discs uh, from overseas. And we were like, there's a d- director that I, I really admire. His name was uh, Hayao Miyazaki. And yeah. I, would, uh, I would take his shows, we would watch the shows, and I'd literally be watching it three, four, five times to try and analyze what they were doing because they were like, <clears throat> in America, we were doing like the traditional, you know, medium, close up, long shot, but all traditional medium shot angles. Whereas over there, they were actually experimenting with 2D animation and making it look 3D by using, you know, pans and, and slides and um, rendered cells. So for me, I was like, that was the start of my influences. I mean, I had art, artistic influences like, uh, like Jeff. At Kirby and John B. Sema and Gil Kane and stuff like that. Sure. But Miyazaki as a filmmaker is the one that influenced me the most. And so from 1980 until the time I did the, uh, did the G.I. Joe movie intro, I had like maybe about, you know, I had a lot of experience in experimenting and seeing what worked, what didn't work. And so when I got a chance to do the intro, I just kind of threw the kitchen sink at, at it and said, okay, let me sure. just start sure. for it, you know. And like I said, I didn't, I didn't think they were going to animate it all. Yep. I did. You did. <laughs> that was great. And um, just so you know, also, the right after the intro, the first, I think, 10 minutes of the show were Pythonus going into the mm-hmm. lair. Get after yeah. The yeah. Yep. yeah, that was all me. I storyboarded all that also. I, I noticed so, on your website, you did the first 10 minutes, right? Yeah, about the first 10 minutes of Pythonus getting into the place. And then after me, it was... Um, the director's name is uh, Frank Parr, who became the director of uh, Gargoyles. He picked it up okay. after that, after all, all the fights and stuff like that. Yep. Um, so there's another director, uh, Boyd Kirkland, that came after him. I, but I don't know where. I think it was the, um, the sequence where um, uh, the, the training sequence that they were training all these new kids. Right. Mm-hmm. I think he took over that section. But. It becomes big. <laughs> my memories after that. I I don't remember. <laughs> that. I mean, it's it's got to be some, hard. At when some point, produced. it just becomes drawings. Yeah. <laughs> when you've created yeah, that much true. stuff, it's got to be hard to recall it all. I I know you probably don't want to recount everything that you've worked on. Uh, I did a little research this afternoon. I'm going to quickly rattle off some show names that the audience will recognize. And uh, if the, we're trying to be interactive with the show. So during commercial breaks, okay. we'll pause it. And I'll be checking uh, commercials dur- while we're playing. While we're playing the cartoon, I'll be checking comments. And then during the commercials, I'll ask you any questions from the audience so the audience can ask okay. questions. Uh, audience, okay. if you could keep the comments, please, to just questions for Mr. Houston tonight, Larry, excuse me, um, then we will uh, relay those during the commercial break. But make it easy for me to find the questions, all right? Um, okay, so Larry Houston, Emmy-nominated producer, director of X-Men the Animated Series. I've got four monitors in my office. G.I. Joe, Real American <laughs> Hero, you worked on it. Batman the Animated Series, I don't think you did. X-Men, you worked on it. And Exo yeah. Squad, your good friend Will Munizo uh, was director of that. So um, I'm a huge fan of your work. Uh, you were the first African-American storyboard artist in L.A., is that correct? Uh, that is correct. In um, 19, a film company called Filmation in 1981, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I didn't know it at the time. I just, want, I was just happy to get paid to get, get a job, you know. <laughs> um, but the company, Filmation, had gotten so much work from overseas. They, were hiring, they had this hiring, um, they were hiring people like crazy. And um, I got lucky. I got hired to be a part of it. And uh, it wasn't until way later that, I mean, way later, I mean, like, you know, maybe 20 years ago, I found out that I had broken a, um, a glass ceiling. I had, I had no idea, but there had not been any, a, a, there had not been a, um, a black artist hired to be a storyboard artist for that category. Right. Uh, up until I got the job, there had been other people like a, a friend of mine who at Disney, mm-hmm. who worked as a black animator, he worked on um, okay, uh, Jungle Book that had done some storyboards in the movie but never got credit for it. So I, I was actually the oh. person that got hired oh. for that position oh. in that job. 
So, so you oh, yeah. went on. I, I want wow. the audience to know wow. this so they can ask pertinent questions uh, to, that are relevant to your experience. So you went on to uh, storyboard and direct Thundar, Spider-Man and his amazing friends, G.I. Joe, G.I. Joe the movie, which we just talked about, Mr. T, Batman, Johnny Quest, Teenage Mutant, Ninja Turtles, Captain Planet, The Fantastic Four, Mighty Orbots, Bionic <laughs> 6, Exo Squad. I want to find out what your role was on Exo Squad. Uh, Bucky O'Hare, Jim, Cops, another Hasbro brand, Spawn, Todd McFar McFarlane, and many more. Uh, you created the opening titles for G.I. Joe, the movie that we just talked about, the first 10 minutes of that. You also drew the animated series intros to the X-Men, which is my second favorite cartoon behind oh, G.I. Joe. Yeah. G.I. Yeah. Joe, the movie, ro uh, Robocop, Alpha Commando, and The Karate Kid. You wrote an episode of Spider-Man and an episode of G.I. Joe. I want to know about that. Um, <laughs> you also created comic books. Your first love was comic books, and you produced three uh, as a 20-something, and then you're producing comic <laughs> yeah. books now. So I think at the end of this, let's talk a little bit about what you're doing, you know, current yeah, day. Yeah, for sure. And, for and sure. I want to, I you know, crack right. open that a little bit. Um, but I think the, the key of this show is to watch cartoons and get commentary, and I'm going to try to be as quiet as possible, which is hard for me. Yeah, and, and, and Larry, if, the, if, there's, if there's something in, the, in this episode that you want us to see or you want to tell us about, by all means, just jump right in there. Please tell uh, me to stop please. the cartoon at any time. Like, say, hey, yeah, Carson, yeah, just yeah. stop it right here and, yeah. and just go deep on it, and I'll start it back whenever you're ready, okay? Don't be shy. Yep. No, I'm enjoying your questions because your questions are actually activating my memory cells. <laughs> oh, good, 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 good. Yeah, we'll we'll have some questions for you as we go. Uh, okay, so we're on what part four of the mass device? Part four, Larry. If you want to come back for part five, we're finishing tomorrow night. Just throwing it out there, and that's a no pressure proposition. <laughs> okay. Larry, I wonder if uh, if you might share any uh, embarrassing stories about Buzz Dixon. <laughs> I wish I did. You know, Buzz, the writers, they were they were physically in another building, so we never got a chance sure. to meet them. We would just oh, wow. get their okay. ship and uh, just start dealing with the scripts as a, as a director or as a storyboard artist. So gotcha. I never got a chance to, to deal, deal with them. I got it. Like the one episode that I did get a chance to write, I, I co-wrote it with one of the writers. Mm -hmm. And wow. um, it was um, Hearts and Cannons, I believe it's called. Yeah. And when I came up with the premise, the premise was like one of those Bob Hope being Crosby road shows. I figured, let's try, and, let's try and do a story that's based upon just two characters. They're rescuing a princess and trying to get her from safe to safety from point A to point B. Along the ways, they're all trying to hit on her, you know, along the way, mm -hmm. just like the you guys did. And that was the basic premise of that episode. It's a great so, episode. <laughs> yeah, so the, you know, the writer said, you know, he had a chance to flesh out what I was talking about we tried to get personalities that could work well against each other at the time so mm -hmm. that's, and unfortunately i can't remember the characters i remember what they looked like but the names escaped me for the two that i picked one thing that we've been doing from episode to episode is uh one of our different cast members has been doing a recap of what's happened up until now uh robert atkins did a very long one and tom feister did a <laughs> medium length one do we want to see if brandon can do a short one I believe Roberts is still going on. I'm not sure. Yeah, can we check no, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like a Catholic mass. You can walk into it in the middle and there's still seven hours left. Right. Uh, okay. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's fine. No. So let's see. Uh, let's see. Cobra got uh, the first of the, the three elements. Uh, and then um, uh, Snake Eyes adopted a dog. And uh, I, I may have been drinking when I watched it. Uh, let's see. Uh, Cover Girl explained the plot. Uh, and there was something about heavy water and tube worms. Oh, and a hairy detail. Yeah, I kind of all everything you're mentioning. Is, it sounds so familiar. I wish I <laughs> so before coming on board. I don't remember it any better than Larry does, and I just watched it last night. So that's where we're, we're at. We're giving, you know, uh, we're, we're giving Larry flashbacks in hopefully a positive way. <laughs> the, the, the Joes are in peril. The Joes have been uh, gas attacked. Right. And Duke managed to squeeze off like nine lines of dialogue before he finally succumbed to the fumes. Yeah. Okay. And anyone who's ever been in a room with Brandon knows what that gas attack is like. <laughs> <laughs> we can relate. Uh, Tom, uh, your your friendship uh, to me is very special. I you are one of the most important people I've ever interacted with. It's Tom, right? It is. It's it's still okay. Tom. Great. <laughs> All right. So the Joes and the Cobras actually both 
uh, successfully recovered the heavy water element. Snake Eyes struggles to remain alive in the snowstorm and is suffering from radioactive poisoning. I'm cheating and reading. He manages to save a wolf, which is Timber, and he becomes his makeshift pet. The pair are rescued by a blind hermit who cures Snake Eyes of his poisoning and injuries. The Joes are overjoyed to see their comrade alive. Uh, side note, he did get a hug from Scarlet, so there is a little romance in the cartoon. She didn't hug anybody guys, else. She hugs Snake Eyes. You guys Eyes. are looking hard for the Snake Eyes Scarlet thing. You really, it's there. Uh, I appreciate it's there. it. As, a, as somebody who worked that relationship very hard in the comics, I, yeah. I appreciate you looking out for it. So, however, his canister was booby trapped by Cobra causing poison gas to flood the air. So at the end of the episode, we basically don't know if the Joes are alive or dead. So with that... Uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> spoiler alert. The cartoon goes on for another 80 episodes, so I'm pretty sure they're alive. Wait, uh, wouldn't that be the right. best, though, is that we just wipe out the entire wave of figures? We're like, nope, here we go. Here's yep. uh, Start over. Uh, Lightfoot, I guess. <laughs> wave two. All right. Um, you guys let me know how the volume is for you, okay? Sure. Okay. Oh, and hide all the fans watching and commenting. We appreciate you uh, more than we can say. Thanks, yeah. guys. Never get tired of this. No. No. no I, I, we no. kind of fight against like wanting to just sit back and watch the show. Every time it starts, I'm like, ah, I'm just like ready to watch it. Wait, yeah, we're supposed to. No. Start. Larry, when's the last time you actually watched the show? Uh, I think the last time I watched, actually watched the show might have been here, uh, many years ago. I just found out that it's back online now. They just put it on YouTube or something. So I haven't had a chance That's what to spurred this on. Uh, we, uh, that, that, that's exactly what spurred this on is when it had appeared. We thought it would be fun to, to watch this again with some friends. So welcome, new friend. <laughs> yeah. Well, right after this beginning, the very first opening was the, uh... I'm sorry, Larry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was waiting for the... I was going to wait for it. I was going to say that the, um... Go ahead and talk. <laughs> yeah, I will yeah, pause this at any yeah. time. You let me know. Yeah. <laughs> the very first episode of this, uh, I did the opening of it, where you, it opens on the, the shadow of the jets coming in. Yes. The Cobra attack, that was all me. I directed all that part. Oh, uh, see, I love that. Oh, wow. That bit is very filmic, and, and it's like, it's, it's, an, it's an amount of time that you didn't need to spend. Like, that could have been five guys fighting again, right? But you took the moment to give that nice filmic intro with the jet. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I wanted to, and I tried to put as much, um, at the time when we were working on the show, I was trying to introduce a lot of the Japanese techniques into the show. But the directors who were working with us were from the old school of like, um, you know, the, the Tom and Jerry's and stuff. And so we had to, we were trying to get them, educate them to what we wanted to try and do. It was a little push and pull because they were like, they had their way of doing it. And we, we were the young young punks coming in trying to change the world, you know. And uh, so that, luckily I was able to went out and uh, we got a lot, a lot of that stuff into the show to try and make it look. We wanted the show to look not like everything else, you know. We wanted to look different. And uh, luckily we were successful in uh, getting that done. It, it, it really changed the rest of American animation. I mean, there, you know, the, the filmation stuff, they would you know, rely on the stock backgrounds <laughs> and those stock shots. Uh, this just looked leaps and bounds beyond that stuff. Yeah, so, and also, so there was... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. So I was going to say also with with the uh, with the advent of uh, complicated shows, we were able to actually do normal adventure shows because up until GI Joe and up until like He Man, you couldn't have normal combat, you know, you know, good guy versus bad guy uh, actions going because they thought it was too violent, quote unquote. And so yeah. the fact that GI Joe was syndicated meant that we could get around the rules that networks. The limits they put on us, but sure, we, we still operated within the fact that we were making this for a certain demographic, mm -hmm. but we could actually have fun with it, which is yeah. uh, a lot of us enjoyed that quite a bit. So, when I was in college, um, I was gonna say, when I was in college, Doug Wildy uh, came to our school to speak and he spoke a little bit about standard practices and uh, how difficult it was to tell action stories 
uh, you know, during the time he was making Johnny Quest and then Planet of the Apes and some of that stuff. So if, if I remember correctly, it, wasn't, it was under the Reagan administration that the FCC relaxed some of those rules allowing for shows like this to happen. Yeah, you're correct. That was back in the 80s, yeah. And he, they did yeah. relax them for, um, for network television, but it really, the, the uh, syndicated... Um, but the rules didn't really apply to syndicated shows. So that's what allowed a lot of us to get, you know, like G.I. Joe, Transformers, um, He-Man, um, Thundercats, all that stuff. That's what allowed that to get on the air was because of the less, because it was syndicated. Yeah. Uh, what is the, uh, what is the turnaround time from literally genesis of an episode to completed episode? What, what is the turnaround there? Uh, the average time is about nine months per episode to turn wow. out one. Yeah, and so what it is is that overseas, um, you have about maybe about six, maybe maybe about six uh, animation studios. And so once you get something sent to them, it will go to Studio One, and the next one they would get about a week later will go to Studio Two, and we'll go in that type of uh, arrangement until you know. Until the first studio delivered their episode, they'd have another shipment of a show coming right afterwards. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was, it's very late. It was a very labor-intensive uh, process to get it done from script to delivery. Wowzers! Yeah, Sometimes I knew it took like, a while. I didn't realize it took that long. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So you can have like six, seven, eight different <clears throat> studios. But I think most of most of these, the GI Joes, were all done in Korea. And my best memory is that it was like between six different studios that work was being shipped out to. Wow. You know, that's why you also saw the difference in quality because they went to different places, you know? Yeah. And um, sometimes, you know, you just didn't know what, as an artist, as a director, we try and make the show as, as um, full as we could with a lot of action. But, you know, when the stuff would go overseas, you know, those studios are stuck with maybe a budget that they have to make a profit on. And so they'll cut back on what you're asking them to do in order to, to make the show and then make it at a profit. So that's what that's something, I, you know, we all learn, you know, trial and error. And so we learned how to um, either make the things easier for them to animate or um, in some cases you just fill it up with everything you think is necessary to make the scene dramatic and just let them pick out what they couldn't do because they, you know, didn't know what their budgets were. Yeah. <clears throat> I had a quick now, question. So there's, inevitably, there's a couple little times where there's an animation blip, somebody's wearing a different color, somebody's mouth isn't moving, and last episode, uh, Torpedo's nose disappeared. Like, was there <laughs> an opportunity to, like, submit a revision or revise something yourself, or was it you just had to run with what you got? What would be requested? We would request a retake. Basically, we would tell them like, okay, this scene, the mouth is off the face. You know, you got to reshoot and put it over here, things like that. And we would request a retake. Now, the thing is, overseas companies when they do retakes, uh, they're not being paid for it. That to them, to them, that's a mistake that they got to eat. Oh wow! And so sometimes you get the retakes back, sometimes you wouldn't because the moment you have them do retakes on a show they've already turned in, that puts them behind on the next show that's coming through the pipeline. Yeah. And so what we would do when we were editing the shows, that we would edit the shows with the, with the idea like, if I don't get this retake, how can I fix it? Right. You know, right. so we would, we would have a plan on trying to get it, but if not, Maybe we could grab a scene from another show, grab a scene and maybe uh, do something in post-production to fix it. it. It happened or, you know, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. That's why you see all the errors sometimes. Because we, no, we had no budget, we had no time. We were doing 65 episodes. At the speed, you know, it's like the train was running and we got to, you couldn't stop it, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and yeah. you know uh, there are there are so many distinct characters that all had to be designed, not just main characters but also background characters. There, there was a ton of drawing going on to to get this show just to the point where they could animate it, right? 
Yeah, yeah. And um, a lot, a lot of the, the toy companies actually wanted us to put more detail on the characters, and we actually, we would just listen to, listen to them talk, and we kind of ignored them because, you know, <laughs> they don't, they didn't understand animation. You know, you can't put yeah. that much detail in the kind of shows we were, we we're trying to do there. Yeah. And, uh, you know. Every pocket has to be tracked. Every strap, every buckle, uh, every you know bit of webbing that has like you know Scarlet's shoulder pad there. Every one of those lines has to be tracked for how thick it is from shot to shot. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's really it's an amazing undertaking, and the show, the the, the fact that the show looks as great as it does and still holds up is mm -hmm. just astounding. And that you did it in the time that you were you had to to do it in, and on that budget, it's just fantastic. So, so there were how many episodes were there per season? Does anybody know this offhand? And I'm not trying to stump Larry right here. Obviously, it's been decades, right? So this, this isn't. I like know a we, did, we, we did three minis, either two or three mini series, and then mm -hmm. after that, they said, "Okay, here's 65, go." All That's right, so. What, I've got the I've got the wiki pulled up. You uh, you got a five episode miniseries, then you had another five episode miniseries, and then it went from episodes eleven, seemingly down to sixty five, which is called season yeah. one. That's a ton of episodes, and then yeah, sixty six. Yeah. I think it goes to it's ninety five into your tent. I will silently creep. So uh, sixty six to ninety five. So about thirty episodes in the in the second season. Um, about fifty six actually fifty six exactly episodes in the first season. Right. such a tremendous amount of content um if i could go through here i, I should have done my homework and looked at this uh it looks like though those 30 episodes for the second season came out in 86 and the 60 or 56 episodes for the first season came out in 85 that is an ungodly amount of work um <laughs> what, what did your yeah. staff look like uh i know you guys did the storyboard here and they did the animation overseas but but what what did your team look like we had, um, if I remember right, I think we had five people like myself. We had five directors and a supervising director. And we both were in charge of our, you know, one, you get episode one, I get episode two, you know, you pass it on down. And each of us had like a, had um, at least about three, six, nine, about nine artists working for us each. And so we, it was like a ton of work and we would, um, we would just, I mean, from, from in the 80s, if you could draw a little bit, you got a job, wow. <laughs> you know, wow. you know, and we were, and wow. a lot of guys, guys I, I hired and I trained them to try and become a better artist because we just had so much work we had to get through, through, into, through the system. And, uh, but yeah, I got my, when I started on G.I. Joe, I started off as a storyboard artist and wow. uh, I think it was. Uh, one of the directors, oh God, I think his name is Jim Duffy. Uh, really? He left He left it for another job. And so I got promoted to being a director in the middle of the season. And so from that point forward, I was, I've been a director ever since working on different shows. But that's where I cut my teeth on learning how to, how to be a director. And it's different when you're a storyboard artist. You, most of the shows that are, are uh, broken down into just three acts, act one, two, and three. And usually I asked them for act three because that's where all the action was. And once you became a director, suddenly now you got to you got to step back and look at the big picture. Now not only do you have um, the show that you got to you know you got to deal with the whole show and all the continuity, and also you got to deal with three different artists telling a story three different ways. And so there were a lot of like what I call speed bumps sometimes where you know, it didn't exactly always mesh together. Mm -hmm. And so I'd have to, it was a trial and error thing where you learn how to, um, um, I call it casting artist. If I found an artist who was good at machinery or another artist that was good at um, character moments, or I would try and cast the, the artist in a section that I thought he would do really well, mm -hmm. so that when the work came back to me, I didn't have to change it that much. Um, and I tried to catch everything I could in the script level. Because if you can catch a mistake in the script, you can just cross it out and, and correct it. But when you, when you get a stack of storyboard pages back, each page is, each, each artist section was at least about 100 pages long. 
Mm-hmm. You got a stack of 300 pages you got to edit that if he had just caught it earlier, it would have been <laughs> one minute, you know, a caption or whatever. Yep. Um, you learn. But from that no. point forward, you know, learn how to, how to direct it and how to make production as smooth as possible. So as the director, just, and, and, you know, I know it's, it was a, a different time, so I'm sure the processes were different, but so you would have had your storyboard team, your character design team, your background team, a layout team, um, or was that, sometimes. was the layout stuff done in, uh, in Korea? Uh, layouts were done here only if it was like um, a very specific, difficult scene that you didn't want them to screw up. And so okay. we could, we we could, we could hire someone, okay, here's a scene, set it up so that when we ship, when we ship the show, they can see exactly what we're looking for. But gotcha. the machine was running so fast, we couldn't do layouts here. So that's gotcha. why it was really important that the storyboards reflected as much information as you could, as, accurate, as accurately as you could before we you know, shipped it off. And, gotcha. Um, yeah, so it was, uh, yeah, it's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a lot of I feel like I can actually, watch the stress coming back to your face as you're just talking <laughs> about it. <laughs> At oh, first yeah, it was yeah. positive flashbacks and now he's having negative flashbacks. So we yeah. turned the corner on that pretty quick. <laughs> Larry, when, you're, when we started this, your hair was not gray, was it? <laughs> <laughs> so I, yeah. I'd like to ask, because I'm just a simpleton writer uh, and I can't do what, what you guys do. I can't draw, I can't animate. Like, what is, so what is the tough... <laughs> oh, true. Oh, Tom, couldn't you be going through a tunnel right now? Um, uh, what is the hardest part of this? What 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 is what is the hardest part of 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 animation? What what is the the single greatest obstacle every time? Because I I know in writing I I I have a variety of obstacles, uh, most of which are my intellect and uh, creativity, but what. I, I have to think that in something as complicated as this, there has to be a sort of common hurdle. What is the common hurdle? I, I, I'm trying to narrow, narrow it down. In terms of writing, I say in writing, try not to use phrases and the battle ensues. Or oh, the cavalry comes over the cliff. You know, those are the two that when as an artist you see it, you're going, oh, fuck, oh, shit. I'm sorry, Ken. I don't know if I can say that, but I'll beep you. We're gonna have a okay. tip jar yeah. for people that cuss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's fine. But those, are, those when you re- when you read Tom that, already owes us nine thousand dollars. Yeah. <laughs> those are the, those are the scenes when when you're as a you, when a writer turns into script and you see that you're going, oh my god. And so when I would catch that, sometimes I would just scratch it out and just try and be specific, like. You know, gung ho does this, or, uh, or you know, give it specific actions as opposed to a generic um, phrase because the artist has no idea what to draw. It's funny you mentioned that, Larry. Robert Atkins is a comic book artist, and he's been lamenting since the first episode when writers use dozens of anything. <laughs> so. Oh my God, yes. Oh, that it, it's like you read that going, oh, you know, it's very easy to type it. Dozens, there you go. Yep. <laughs> That's what Take, I'm talking about. Takes you about. a second to write it. it. Takes him hours to draw it. I don't know how many the, times I've read that in the description. Dozens of ninjas. And I mean, I love drawing ninjas as much as the next guy. But oh my gosh. Like, <laughs> Robert yeah. hates dozens. Robert hates dozens. <laughs> so, so I do have a couple of questions from the Facebook folks. Uh, Trapier Gervais, which has the most interesting name on my Facebook feed, said, did Larry work on Black Star? Do you have any recollection of Black Star, Larry? Uh, yes, I did. That was at Fil- a filmation show. Okay. And it was like uh, two guys, if I remember right, it's um, Black Star and the bad guy was named Overlord. And they had, they had two pieces of the same sword split in half. And, you know, the bad guy's always trying to get his sword and that kind of stuff. But, yeah, I did work on it as a storyboard artist. Awesome. And um, a little little thing about Black Star back then, mm-hmm. um, when it was pitched to CBS, I think it was, it was actually supposed to be a black character. Huh. But they didn't think uh, black characters were cool back then, so they made them an Indian character. And that's, that's kind of wow. the Black Star. Character. Interesting. Yeah. That's um, crazy. So there was a question, Tom, do you want to cue this one up? 
Uh, sure. Well, my question, uh, I think Robert just touched on it a bit. So as a director, uh, are, when you would get scripts from your writers, were there things that you would have to talk them down from? Like, you know, we're going to have two acts and in both acts, there's going to be a large number of uh, characters on the screen at the same time, all fighting. And so you would get the script and you would know this one's going to be a budget buster for the season and you would have to talk them down from that? Were there, were there things like that that you would have to uh, regularly talk new writers down from? Um, I would basically, I would talk to the story editors and tell them like, um, this is way too many characters. We're gonna cut them, we're gonna cut this down instead of like dozens to maybe, maybe literally just a dozen. You know, that gotcha. kind of stuff. <laughs> and we would, just, we, we would just go back and forth and they said, oh, that's cool, go ahead, you know, make it work. So we didn't have any problems with that. How many episodes at a time would you have on your desk when you're boarding and, and working through something? Because I'm sure you had to do several episodes at a time just to get that number of episodes out for a season. Once, once the machine got going, I had at least about three shows on my desk mm -hmm. at any one time once, once everything started moving because I would have shows that I've shipped and I also would have shows that are coming back. Mm -hmm. So I have to, I'd have to go with the um, film editors to edit the show down to length mm -hmm. and call retakes. And so I had to keep literally almost like four shows in my head at the same time. Mm. Shows coming in, film coming back, editing the shows, calling retakes. Um, so it was, it was a huge process. I mean, there were, my wife was telling me at times I'd come back. I, I couldn't even remember my name sometimes because it had so many, <laughs> so many shows in my head. Yeah. Yeah. But, that was part of the process back then. It was, um, and it wasn't digital. Everything was like on a moviola. You were cutting yeah. film. So it was a little bit more, Yeah, you know, we didn't have as many options as, as we have today with the digital way to fix stuff really fast. We sure. basically, get, it, was, it was cut and splice and fix stuff, that kind of stuff. So related wow. to delivery, I had one more good question from the Facebook. I've got a lot of commentary, so you guys can read that at your leisure <laughs> after the show. I'm not going to, I'm not going to inundate you with that. Uh, Keith Braun wanted to know uh, when they were delivering the product back from you for review from overseas, what was, what, what format did the finished product come back in for review? Was it one inch beta VHS? Not sure. Uh, it was film, physical film. film. Okay. Yeah, and cool. we would put it on the movie all and just start cutting film like that. And once we, wow. Cut, once wow. we yeah, and once we would cut, basically we had, once we, it's what they call lock picture, we would, once the picture was locked to a certain lamp, then we would make, they would make copies of that. And you'd send a copy over to somebody to do sound effects, another copy to another, another uh, person to do the music, and another, another artist to do the, the voices. Mm -hmm. I mean, not mm -hmm. to do the voices, but to, to uh, go through and, and drop the voices into the right spot. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so we have basically lock picture. Everybody's doing their thing. And I'm waiting on um, retakes to come in. And knowing that if the retakes don't come in, sometimes you, you, you leave blank spaces on screen, hoping you would get something to fill it in before you had to go to post. And so... Um, most of the time, it didn't make it. Sometimes it didn't. So we had to perform magic. Like, okay, grab show 17. Grab that airplane. Put it over here. You know, we would just do some fixes like that. to fill, fill in the hole, so to speak. And, um, yeah, it, it, it wasn't until, I'm trying to remember the year, but I think it was, um, oh, God, maybe in the late 80s when we were working in post-production, the, the computer system was getting better and better, so they were able to do some fixes in the computer, mm -hmm. but it was pretty expensive. And so my boss would tell me that if you really got to do it, you know, make sure it, you know, it's something real important. So other than that, um, that's kind of the process we had to go through in the 80s. We could, we could talk I for can hours. See why it, it probably feels like <laughs> know, just right? a complete blur because uh, I mean, if you're juggling three shows at once, you know, three episodes, and they're all at these various stages of completion, and you're also sending those locked films out to get worked on, I can see why it's a blur of memory, because it sounds like, so how many years was it, in your career, was it that intense? It's like between the different shows, between G.I. Joe and then X-Men and other shows that you worked on for a long period of time, like, how many years was it that frantic? 
Um, the, I think um, when I first became a director, it was like 84, I think. So from 84 until I think the year 2000, um, it, that's the way it pretty much was. But as it got closer wow. to the year 2000, wow. it got easier. Like on the X-Men, um, they increased the budget so that um, I have people, I have post-production people helping me. I give them notes and they would take care of it as opposed to me being there to watch it all the time. I would just do lock picture and then hand it off to someone else. Um, and then just look at the final results either from my okay. And so it was, um, but up until, I guess until the late into the X-Men, which would have been 96, 95, um, it was it's all film, cut and paste, cut, I mean, cut and cut film and splice and dice and all that kind of stuff. Oh, wow. Okay, we should probably fire up the episode. One, I could literally one, sit here last, all night, all night. <laughs> we, we have to, re yeah, we have to reward our view, our viewers for staying here with us. Um, I, I, why would they not? With Larry Houston here, they have a reason tonight. Um, okay, so we have one more question from Webster. His question was, was it voice or dialogue uh, before animation or vice versa? Which came first? Uh, voice, voices, what, voices come first. Uh, let me, okay, let me back up a second. Um, in the beginning, when we first did the shows, we were able to storyboard the show first and then hand it off to the voice actors so they can see what, were, what was happening in the show. But as uh, voices kept going, the storyboards lagged behind. And at some point, they just started recording the shows without the storyboards. And it was up to the uh, voice director, I think it was Wally Burr, it was. to explain to them, um, okay, you're in a helicopter. So screen this, or you're in a tunnel, so whisper this. It was all up to him at a certain point to direct the actors. But it did start off with the boards first, and then it just kind of got away from us. And that's right. usually- So it so started with the boards, and then the voiceover recording got ahead of the boards. And so wow. Wally Burr was basically painting a picture for these voice actors in the studio. <laughs> oh, awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to kick it back to the cartoon. And again, please, Larry, uh, if there's anything that, you know, strikes a memory or, or something you want to pause and, and talk about, please let me know. Otherwise I'll just pause okay. it at the next commercial break for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, good God. I, I forgot we were supposed to be watching this show. <laughs> right? <laughs> Who cares about the cartoon? Larry's here. That's right. Larry, at now the back very to least. Three guys in their forties staring at Larry Houston. <laughs> so true. <laughs> But I'm okay with that. Now nah, there's only three of us. Tom doesn't count. Wow. L Larry, if I'm ever uh, anywhere near your vicinity, I'm, I'm definitely going to have to treat you to dinner as a thank you for doing this. Yes. I'm furiously angry. I just moved out of LA. I could have taken him to dinner. You could have been friends. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was Brandon. I've Something been here we were for talking all my lifetime. Something we were talking about, Larry, on the last couple episodes, they make some costume changes to the characters. Um, for example, Breaker, I believe, is wearing all gray instead of all green. Um, did you guys reference the toys and then and then make decisions of these people look too similar, so we're going to make X, Y, and Z changes? Or at what point did you diverge from the, the toy designs? What was the decision making behind that? Um, pretty much we tried to follow the toy, toys as much as possible unless there was a real problem with, um, with uh, the show. And the, the costume changes we're talking about probably occurred because of um, something in production, which unfortunately I can't remember, but sure. no, we tried our best to follow the toys as much as possible. Um, you know, like on these things, like with a uh, soccer, we tried to um, simplify the costume because we knew it had to, you have to animate this guy. Yeah, it was all cell frame. For people that are younger, there's younger generations on YouTube watching these things after the fact. Every one of these frames was hand drawn and hand painted. So this is an entirely different process of creating cartoons than most of the yeah, stuff and, that we use now. And camouflage must be a nightmare, right? I can't imagine. Yeah, so that kind of stuff we have to you'd have to design it with a specific shape. And so that when the character when it turned, it didn't pop on you. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. was part of the simplification of, of the of the design. 
Larry, one of the things we talked about, uh, Snake Eyes, obviously one of the most popular characters, he's just all in black. Uh, so for the cartoon, you guys made him more of a kind of purplish color. You gave him some uh, highlighted purple accents on the pouches, and then you took his gloves off. He's just got, you know, flesh hands so that I guess when he's karate chopping and running, you can see the hands moving. That's one of the bigger changes that's like immediately obvious to all the fanboys. Yeah. Yeah, part of that was, yeah, that, that was part of it. It was, um, there was a concern about, um, you know, can you see stuff happening? And so the clarity of having the hand flesh color, so like right now with the uh, Cobra Commander, his black gloves, sometimes it gets lost in the um, background and you have really dark background, so. Yep. That's a, another reason why that would, that kind of change would occur, yeah. So I've asked this question in almost every interview I've ever conducted with anyone in any field. Is there a gig you passed on that you kick yourself to this day oh, for dude. not getting involved with? Um, I think the, the one I can remember was probably Gen 13. I was supposed to be the director on Gen 13. I, the, we couldn't make out the, the, the deal, but that was one that I was going to work on. Did you make a trailer for that, Larry? Was there a test scene that was done? I think there was. It wasn't mine, though. But okay. I, I, was, I was interviewed to uh, become the director of the show. I feel like maybe a trailer, a bumper uh, was done. Or that might have been Wildcats. You know, Gen 13 Wildcats, they kind of blur. Yeah. But it didn't come to fruition. Right. Yeah, right. I think you might have dodged a bullet on that one, Larry. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you did fine on your other properties. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I'd put that one in the wind column if I were you. <laughs> you had a couple other shows that seemed to work out for you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, tell, I tell when I go to the different conventions, I tell uh, the people come visit me that um, I feel very blessed because in the 80s and 90s, I was, I, was, I was in the right place at the right time to work on almost all the Adventure shows. And I feel like I was able to make a difference in the entertainment to make it more interesting and exciting by bringing some of the um, anime approaches to the storytelling, to the show. And also trying to bring my own sensibilities and what I thought was to make the show exciting. Uh, I can tell you that, you know, around the office that I'm at, we still talk about G.I. Joe. Way to go, Joe! That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's... Uh... Yeah, a, a big influence on many, many, many of us. I mean, obviously, we're, we're all here. We, we've been doing this every night this week, Larry. Uh, it, it's just, it's something that's stuck with us, and it's got to feel amazing to have that legacy and to impact an entire generation of kids that, in that way, to that level, you know, to where we still love it. I'm you sorry. mentioned, er oh, sorry, go ahead. No, it's good. I'm gonna I'm gonna copy and paste some questions for the commercial break. <laughs> okay, okay. You mentioned earlier that you were trying to follow the toy line and and take inspiration from that, but but and now we have to hold you accountable as fans who have always wanted these things. What about all the things we saw that we never got toys of, Larry? What about that? <laughs> Where did that come from? You, you guys had a lot of opportunity early on to create vehicles and fill in those holes of where things were missing. I wish I would have been in charge at that point. I had several bosses higher way higher above me that made all those decisions you know now, now that actually brings up a good question as far as were there things that you designed that hasbro came back to you and asked you to redesign uh simply because they couldn't afford to make the toy or were there specific things they came to you and said we are going to produce a toy we don't have a design for it yet and you know, and I'm bringing up things like the Cobra Castle, that eventually led yes. to the silent issue. Yes. So were, were there instances where uh, you were asked to create something because the, you, they knew that they were going to make a toy of it somewhere down the road? Um, there were there were times in the script where they the, the writer called for certain locations that there were never toys for, and so yeah, well, the castle was like one of them. It's like we came up with we needed something, so that's what we came up with. But everybody seemed to like it, so they, you know, they ran with <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, famously, you know, Larry Hamm has written about 275 issues of this comic, and he wrote all the file cards. And he, and he says, like, he hasn't read the other author's Joe books because he doesn't want to confuse it with his own universe, and he hasn't watched the cartoon. But right. he did see the designs for the, the castle, 
that appeared in this first miniseries and it made right. its way into the comic with the silent issue. Uh, did you have, yeah, I, I've got like that one a lot. Oh, love oh it. it's fantastic. It's, it's, I mean, it was a groundbreaking issue and it's funny because it happened because of time constraints. They didn't have time to write script. They literally, he storyboarded it or, or did the thumbnails basically overnight. Um, so it was really just to, to meet a, a very oppressive deadline that that storytelling device came about. Um, so did you were, ever meet, work with, or talk with Larry, or did he just somehow see this silent castle by happenstance? I, I, I'm friends with Larry, and so he told me that he, he just, he happened to see, see it on a, in the uh, show, mm -hmm. and he asked me about it. I said, yeah, no, I designed it, and it was just something real quick. They needed something real fast, so I was like, okay, let's do a uh, castle, and I mean, it was like, uh, you know, it was just like draw something. And so yeah. I just kind of drew it and got it, got it done. And, um, and he liked it. <laughs> I was surprised. <laughs> I, mean, I, I didn't think it was that good, but I just said, okay, I just did the best I could at the time. It was the best I mean, Cobra base in existence. <laughs> there was nothing better at that time. <laughs> the best one. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I just, I just, I'm starting to put this together in my head. I'm, I'm not the smart one. I'm the handsome one. Uh, you were an adult when we were kids, so we're watching this as kids. You're an adult. When this is first presented to you and somebody says G.I. Joe, does your brain immediately go back to the 60s and the original G.I. Joe? Yeah. Or, or, Yes, it did because I remember what it was. And then when they showed, me, showed us the new toys, we're like, oh, these are little, they're little guys. But the, but the vehicles look really cool. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, they gave us, you know, when we were working on the show, I, I think I have maybe half of them left, but they would give us free toys. And so we would have them and play with them in the office. And um, one of the things I would do, because we, you know, the Hiss tanks and the uh, Sky Strikers, we would actually just hold it up and at certain angles to try and get that dramatic shot to see what it would look like. Because uh, we didn't have any, that was our reference. We had, you know, the, today you can just pull it off the internet or you can make a 3D model and rotate it. But back yeah. then it was like, you know, get the toy or get the tank and do an upshot and see what, what details are visible and draw it. And so that's why they give us a lot of toys to play with. I was gonna say, and, I, use the, I use the same method now. Like you say, well, now you can like make 3D models or whatever. I'm like, no, that's why I have three his tanks up on my shelf. <laughs> Literally that today, I grabbed my his tank to like look at it and pull the draw. Like, so it's like, we still do that. Yeah. Uh, they just yeah. don't send me toys. Oh, you have to buy them yourself. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had a, I had a little patch yeah. where they sent me toys. They they sent me toys for a little bit for sure. Oh yeah, nice. So so Larry, you say you still have some of the toys. If I send you a want list and my address, <laughs> um, um, you know Carson doesn't need any of them, and Robert's got everything ever made, and you know who cares about Brandon? But we'll we'll talk. We'll talk. We'll save it for later. It's okay. We'll, we'll talk. We'll so, talk later. Uh, we do have we do have one an another good qualified question from the Facebook audience. Thank you guys for chipping in. Uh, th actually, this is Keith Braun again. Did you ever reference the comic at all, or was it all toy based? So you just mentioned you know referencing some of the toys, photo you know looking at it from different angles and that kind of thing. Did you ever look right. to the comic for inspiration of how characters or vehicles or maybe even storylines were handled? Oh yeah, we did that when we were doing the character designs. Not only with having the toy, but we also wanted to see how the artist interpreted for for the print medium. And so we kind of like, we'll look at the, what the toy looked like and we, and we kind of like try and hit a medium between the two of like, okay, here's the toy, here's how we can, you know, and we kind of blended it together. And we had the um, fortune to have a, a character designer who had been working and his name was Russ Heath. And yes. he was yes. shows and combat and stuff. And he was our main designer on the show. And he knew references of all, you know, the guns. He knew all that stuff from doing all these war comic books. And so he was the perfect artist to be the art, the character designer on the show. And we went, yeah. So between that, between Russ's uh, history and the comic books and the toys, yeah, he put all, put everything together. You know. So yeah, Russ really, is an amazing uh, talent. Uh, yeah, he was. Um, <laughs> it was a pretty fun old guy. Uh, old guy because he was like maybe 20 years older than me, not, not that far away, but um, he would, I, he would have, the break, he would break up the, the group with all these puns. He, he was like a punster, like crazy. He would just make <laughs> it groan and joke he was coming up with. Oh, 
and he had all these stories where he was at the Playboy Mansion and all these other stuff. He was like a, <laughs> like a eight-year-old kid, you know, working working with us. And so um, he was a real good guy. You know, I really miss you. I really miss him. He was a real good guy. I uh, I had another quick question about um, you mentioned at times you'd be working on two or three episodes at once, or how you would also uh, the workload between like uh, different directors would have different episodes at a time, but Towards the better. I, sorry, I lost you. Yeah, I think Robert's freezing up. So this happened to us last night, and then we were gifted with two Robert Atkinses. <laughs> gifted. <laughs> Robert, okay. you look like you're back, yeah. man. Try it again. Yeah, keep the receipt. Um, yeah, I heard that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it keeps happening to me. Uh, it keeps getting unstable. We can hear you. Go ahead, man. Um, just real quick, when we had a two or three part uh, episode, would one of the directors take that entire kind of multi-part episode and go off in the corner and work on that for a while? Or did you still split up those duties? We tried our best to, if it's like a two-parter, to just give it to one director. Mm -hmm. if, if the schedule allowed for it. But sometimes we'd have like a four-parter, you'd have four directors, unfortunately. It's, it's only... It was a rare thing when you could have one director do a three-parter. Um, and so, yeah, it was kind of rare. But, be, and, and everything, like I say, everything depended upon, it was dependent upon the delivery schedule. Because what it is, is that when you're going to deliver a show, you, okay, they need it by, by December. Okay, you back out nine months and for delivery and then you you know that's how you do everything and so unless the client was willing to to move the air dates we're kind of stuck with uh, you know having to crank it through you know through the through the machine and get it get everything done so um yeah so that basically yeah if you're lucky one director yeah. and that didn't happen very often i think yeah. I think worlds, uh, worlds without world something worlds without like end worlds without end my favorite yeah. two parter yeah yeah I think that was one director but that was like very very rare that was that just struck me as by far the most kind of heavy serious mature uh, you know story arc of the, of the series I absolutely mm -hmm. love world worlds without end yeah I think um, Buzz and the rest of them were able to try and slip in. Some, you know, something to make it more than just stuff blowing up, you know, they try and put in some other, right. some new, you know, some, something, something of more substance is what they right. tried to do down there. Well, Larry, I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, so we'll, we'll keep plowing through the cartoon. <laughs> if you give me a little wink, wink, I'll know like, okay, we got to wrap it up for Larry. <laughs> Otherwise I feel like we'll be, we'll be talking to you all night. <laughs> well, if the wife comes down, she'll let me know. We got to go. Eat. Okay. <laughs> And we, we've seen her in the background. She seems to be happy for now. Yeah, she, she's yeah. letting you hang out for a bit at least. So we appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Tell her thanks for us. Okay, we'll do, man. Um, um, so as we get back into the episode real quick, um, the Smitty series, we see a lot of set pieces. We've talked about that the last couple night, nights where we have a big battle scene. And then obviously be, based on the plot, you know, we have an underwater scene. We have, you know, like the... Uh, the, the winter Arctic scene, and then we've had uh, this air battle scene, right? Was there any any type of a scene that you enjoyed doing more than others when it comes to storyboarding or directing, or like any kind of environment or type of scene that you like to do the best? Uh, for me, the easiest thing the storyboards are the ones that are like um, without structure, that uh, they're not not buildings and stuff. It's like the forest, the underground, you know, stuff like that where you can just right. draw stuff uh, easily without uh, worrying about, you know, when you're drawing stuff in a city like Spider-Man or something like that, there are specific built, building types you got to try and draw so you're not drawing cookie cutter buildings all the time. Um, so um, I'd say, you know, more of the free form. For, for an artist, it's probably easier to do. Right. Yeah. Oh, it's so easy to draw that polar bear in the, in the blizzard. I was like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just love P90X polar bear. that scene with Scarlet. <laughs> yeah. She just single-handedly beat up four Cobra Troopers. We were talking yeah. about <laughs> empowered female characters right out of the gate with G.I. Joe, the, the diversity in terms of 
you know, races, sexes, ages, everything represented. Um, it, it struck it struck me as a kid. Um, Larry, when you first started working on GI Joe, did was that something that was uncommon at that time to have females? You know, starting with 1982, you had a very diverse group of people represented. Was that something that you noticed or, or took any uh, took a liking to? I I guess I guess I, what I can say is that we um, the artists of us working on the show we we liked it obviously and uh, we tried to um, at least at least when I when I was directing on my shows I tried to make sure um, to show the women and show everybody as equal as I could as equal as I could and especially with Scarlett you know she was like the the kick ass woman of the group. Yep. Um, beside, um, oh god, what's that, um... Lady J. Lady J? Lady J and Cover Girl. I tried to get, Cover Girl <clears throat> got the least amount of, uh, air time. I tried to <clears throat> put her in different situations when I could, but sometimes because of the specific dialogue, it wasn't, you know, you couldn't put her into the show. But, um, no, I, I enjoyed the fact that they showcased different, uh, peoples and, and, uh, made it multi, multicultural, multi, not multi, racial whatever you want to call it and uh but you know you had you had quick kick you had spirit you had scarlet you had stalker you had lady j there was there was so much diversity there and i i just absolutely loved it as a kid and scarlet was not only you know kick ass she could beat anybody in the show but she was also intelligent so she's the smartest one in the room yeah and she didn't she didn't uh she, she never stopped i mean even when destro captured her i think she took the arrow and blew up his, the console on the jet you know she yeah. wasn't gonna take any crap you know yeah. that, that's just about to happen <laughs> oh that's in this sequence oh. it's a good lead in larry yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Spoiled it. so so larry <laughs> did it ever creep you out that destro had eyebrows on his metal mask <laughs> I actually never understood that math. <laughs> Neither did we. You know, I didn't know was it painted on? Was it what? What kind of metal was that? Yep. Wow, I still remember that heel into the foot. It's amazing, yeah. it's amazing the scenes yeah. that you recall. No, and it's funny because we make a lot of fun of Duke for getting captured a lot. It's like it's his superpower. But like I, I think again, like it's it's a little progressive in its thinking because it could have easily been Scarlet getting captured all the time and that would have been sad. Right? Yep. Like yeah. Yeah. he says as Scarlet gets captured. Never mind. Just uh, never mind. Good timing, Brandon. Good one. Well he didn't want rock and roll getting her killed. That's true. Right. It was a tough decision to make. He made the right call. Rock and roll is just gonna just blaze happy. that machine gun. I'm just happy rock and roll's getting any kind of screen time at all. It's true. We talked about that last episode. Yeah, Tom loves rock, rock and roll was one of my. He was one of my favorite characters, and and he just I didn't think he ever got enough screen time. It's probably just because he was phasing out. He was 1982 product, yeah. and they were looking towards 84. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's yeah, that's absolutely what it was. I mean, between directors, we would try and tell each other, you know. Try and you know if you can't add this character, <coughs> add this character because we haven't they haven't been seen enough, and we wanted to try and post, you know put more of them on the screen, like like Cover Girl was, was one example. So, well, so when I uh, when I get my time machine perfected, I'm definitely coming back and hitting Larry up for a job so I can draw my rock and roll episode. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, knowing knowing you were trying to kind of fit as many characters in as uh, possible to keep it diverse, I want to know which director had the love affair with Shipwreck. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody did love Shipwreck. Oh God, he was fun. Fellas, we are at the credits here, so I'm just gonna let the credits roll through. Actually, this is the, the teaser for next episode. That's why you need handrails in those castles. Yeah, seriously, it's a construction hazard there. Their insurance has got to be through the roof. <laughs> Love some wild deal. What was great is that the, all the background characters were nice and distinct as well. Yes. Um, you know, again, I, I hate to pick on you know other shows, but a lot of times you would see background characters. It was just the same guy, but maybe his skin color was slightly different. Um, right. 
But, you know, everybody on this show felt like they were cast for that role. They, they all felt distinctive and real. Uh, this is a true story, uh, and I can't go into any detail whatsoever, uh, but I recently wrote an animation pilot. Um, and I said in, in the notes, there must always be, uh, there must always be a character that we, we can't have yet. There must always be something to look at and see uh, that we want uh, because it, it's toy related. Uh, and uh, it, there just always has to be something in the background that will catch your eye and be as exciting as the thing that is going on in the main action. And that comes literally from G.I. Joe because there was always a thing. There was always a character in the background. There was always a thing we couldn't have yet or ever. <laughs> uh, yeah. And there was always something to make you go, ooh, look at that. And, and that has been my guiding principle in all things uh, from the time this happened. And I, I, I know that we go on and on about this. Like, I, I, I know I speak for Robert. And I know I speak for Tom. Uh, and I know I speak for Carson. Like, we can't overstate our love and appreciation of this. We, it, it's impossible to understand the influence this has had on us. So uh, we can't thank you enough. And I, I'm not trying to end this by any means, but I just like, I, I need to express this gratitude right now. Uh, and I can't yeah. even imagine what it's like for you guys as artists, because this must have been a huge, huge influence on you artistically. Well, that's it, it, what I was gonna, the only thing I would add to that is that, you know, I think probably Robert as well, we're, we're sitting in a space that we have because of GI Joe. Yes, because of yes, watching that yes. show, because of going to school and drawing G.I. Joe, because the time spent with the action figures, imagining those adventures, uh, set us on a path of being professional dreamers. Yep. And mm -hmm. that's because mm -hmm. of G.I. Joe. So thank you for my life. Uh, it is. <laughs> I, 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 no, I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding. It, it, was, oh. it, was, it was people like Larry who... Um, open the door to a larger world uh, and I'll put you on the same place with George Lucas and the people who worked on Star Wars and Steven Spielberg, all these people who opened a door to uh, a world of, of imagining that ended up becoming our life and our livelihood. Uh, you know, to say I'm in your debt just doesn't seem to quite capture it. So thank you so much for spending some time with us. I, I can't tell you uh, you know, this whole thing yeah. started as, as as a dumb idea on Facebook a right. few days ago, <laughs> and here we are. A few days and ago. It, just, it seems nuts to me. We we yeah. wanted so, to lighten the mood you. and bring some laughter, and here we are with Larry Houston instead, totally, yep. you know, just nerding out and having a, a, a major <laughs> moment here. So thank you, Larry, for joining us. I, yeah. I, I just wanted to pause the credits here um, and give you the opportunity to uh, maybe say a word or two about the folks, the team that you were working with that, that helped bring this stuff to life. So, so yeah, Rick Holberg, um, he was my co-director on the X-Men when we did the X-Men, Pride mm -hmm. of the X-Men. Uh, Bob Klein was the, uh, I started working with him in, uh, at Filmation. He, was, he did a lot of the presentation work on, um, on the show we just talked about, of, uh, um, um, Black Star. Black Star. And uh, yeah, Black Star and um, and uh, Brave Star. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a really good director and storyboard artist. Uh, Sherman Labby passed away. He he did a lot of live action work. Um, Lonnie Lloyd went on to. She was one of the few women that actually could do action adventure. Uh, she went on to work for several shows. The last one was at Disney. She was working on the princess shows. I think she retired about three years ago. Huh. I'm not sure oh. where Don Shepard went. Um, Hank Tucker, I just had lunch with him about a month ago, and uh, he's still working in the business. I keep telling him why, but he, you know, he likes it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, retire, you know, enjoy your life, but he, you know, he still wants to keep keep at it, so that's yep. cool. Yep. And obviously and then, Russ Heath. Yeah, you talked about Russ Heath, man, just an absolutely incredible designer, illustrator. All right, let's jump out of there. Larry, I, I, want, I want to ask Larry a question. Yeah. Is, is there one piece of advice that you could give to, to someone who has an aspiration to get into animation? Uh, uh, is, is, there, is there a, a sort of golden rule that you can pass down from all your experience? I, I usually tell, what I tell young um, artists who want to be storytellers, what I tell them to do is I ask them, 
Um, what kind of, who is your, what is the favorite movie or director that you would watch over and over again? And, you know, when they tell me, when they figure out what that is, I, I tell them, okay, go home, watch it again, turn off the sound. And while you're watching the film without sound, try and analyze what are you seeing? Medium, long shot, close-ups. What, what is the sequence of images that, that the director is using that you enjoy that you can try and incorporate into your style? And that's one of the things I tell young people to do is, is just, you know, do that. Just try and figure out why you like this style. Why did you like this movie? Why did you like this director? And that's like the easiest thing for, I can tell them to do them. To get to get started on a roll to try and become a better storyteller because that what what I found out for me was that when I was watching all these um, anime shows from overseas it was all in Japan Japanese had no idea what's going on but the director Miyazaki was such a good director that other than a subtext of like you're the uncle you're the father you, you know all the little things you need dialogue for the broad strokes he was excellent at at doing. And it helped me as a, as, a, as a director to incorporate that into my storytelling. So when I got a chance to uh, express that, I was able to put it into the shows of G.I. Joe, X-Men, and other shows that I've worked on. Um, I, I remember, oh, God, it was a show called, um, uh, oh, Mighty Orbots. Mm -hmm. And um, the writer wrote an episode where it starts off with these two characters playing a chess game. And I was opening up a show and I was going, this is going to be boring as hell. So I, <laughs> yeah, so I started the show off where you're in a tunnel, the camera's zooming through a tunnel, you come out of the tunnel, you're in outer space, and as the camera widens, you see these two uh, Gundam type robots going, going at each other, physically bopping each other, shooting rays, and, and just having a little fun. And then at, at, once you get a little bit past that, maybe about two or three seconds, you pull back, and then you see it's actually a holographic chess game, and the people are playing the game there. So it's, it's things like that where when I did that, I, I did that to try and, you know, pick it up. You know, like, this is opening a show. you got to hook the, the, the viewer to watch the show. So I needed something to, to make it more exciting. Yep. And so that's something I did. Now, sometimes I took a chance because sometimes I've done that and the directors didn't like it. Sometimes they did. When I about a year later, the director of Orbox, I mean, yeah, Orbox came in and asked me, "Are you the one who did the uh, robot opening robot sequence?" And I was like, "Uh oh." And I said, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I did. And he actually put out his hand and said, "Thank you." Nice. He actually appreciated that I was able. To, I took it and made it more interesting than what was actually written. Um, I remember doing that on a on a Ninja Turtle show that was out in New York. They didn't like it. They never gave me work again. But you know, <laughs> it, it's you know, I, I just at that point it was like somewhere in the, like two thousands. So I yeah, I took a chance to try and make it better, and they didn't appreciate it. So what can I say? But cool. when I worked on the original ten, Ninja Turtle, did that that when I worked on the original Ninja Turtle show, um, I think I did a hundred and fourteen episodes. Wow. I did wow. I did a lot. And they gave us the freedom to just make up stuff. And that was like another place where I could just take the action and just kick it up and add some anime type action and just make this show interesting, you know, try and make it exciting. Make it I guess there's a little boy inside of me and, and when I'm drawing the stuff, if I can make the little boy inside of me, I try and put the adult cynicism over here, try and work on something and try and pull out of the script, something that would be exciting for me, that maybe if I draw it, it'll be exciting to you. And so that's one of the things I try to do when I'm working on a, on a series. That's What's always the trick, is finding that one thing in a drawing that it might not mean anything to somebody else, yeah. but if it's something that you can plug into, then yeah. it always makes the drawing better. No matter how boring the subject itself might be, if you yeah. can find sites you about it, it always elevates the level of the, the the finished piece yeah well, um, yes yeah and I, whether whether the client can see it or not <laughs> yeah i mean because a lot of times you're doing it you have to do it for yourself because we're spending literally sometimes eight to twelve even longer hours at the table working and 
for you to do anything for that long, you have to have a passion for it, right? You have to, you have to, or you get burned out. Yeah. Yeah. And, very. Yeah. That's absolutely true. So to yeah, bring this it, back to the opening of the GI Joe movie, how long did that sequence take you when you sat down to start roughing it out? Like, and I, I realize this is a long time ago, but you know, from, from sitting down to having the inspiration for what that was going to be to get that out of your head and onto paper. My best recollection, recollection would be, I think we had a two week window to put it together. And so I took about two weeks to try and uh, uh, come up with a premise in my mind, um, Statue of Liberty, you know, and the Cobra's going to attack it and then G.I. Joe's going to protect it. And um, so then I just started coming up with, um, um, let, I just, I, it wasn't planned, I just kind of drew it. Mm -hmm. And then as I drew the scene, oh yeah, it'd be cool if, if Duke did this or this guy did that. And, um, but it was kind of like just, you know, about two weeks and it, 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 it was a short period of time. And um, mm -hmm. uh, it was, I, I think once I got into a role of what, once I figured out what the story was, um, the images started flowing like crazy. Yeah. And it, 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 it was almost writing itself as I, I could see the film in my head and yeah. I tried to get it down on paper as fast as I can. A lot of times some of the images were really scribbling. Like, oh yeah, you can do this, we can do this. You know, the, the, um, having the, the bad guys come down and then punch the camera. That was another thing I always tried to do. I always tried to uh, challenge myself. Okay, what can I do? In a film that nobody's done yet, that I haven't seen yet. So, like the the the, the rope with them punching the camera. I think it was the Crimson Guard or somebody yep. punches the camera. Um, yes. So, Larry, uh, like images. Um, the, uh, before you the move on, like, like like the thing with Stalker, I think shoots a hook into um, one of the flying vehicles, mm -hmm. and and you see the you see the uh, Statue of Liberty dropping back. That was all hand animation. It wasn't computer. I was so impressed, but they did that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, that's but, insane. It's insane. So, uh, Larry, yeah. before you move on, I, I think I've heard this speculated before, and now is as good a time as any first time we've had a one-on-one -on -one conversation, one-on-four. On, you know, um, 1986, uh, CBS News reported from New York City for the 100th anniversary of the Statue of Liberty being dedicated to the United States. Uh, uh -huh. this, was, uh, this was in 1986. The movie came out in 1987. They had festivities centering around the National Mon Monument as some 30,000 vessels ranging from canoes to the Queen Elizabeth II crowded the New York <laughs> Harbor. Could that have been what you saw on TV <laughs> that motivated you to storyboard the intro to G.I. Joe the movie? Yes. I have to say, absolutely. Yeah, yep. when I knew about, I knew about the uh, Statue of Liberty having some sort of celebration. I went. It was a, it was okay, a centennial. I'll run with that. Yes. Yep. There we exactly go. Where it came from. <laughs> so, if, if memory serves, nerves. they had. Um, if, if if memory serves, it had gotten into pretty bad shape, and the uh, there was a it. committee. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So they did a restoration for this, and then at the hundredth anniversary, they I think reopened lost, it. Right. I think we've lost Larry's sound. Am I here? I'm here. I, oh, no, I, can hear. Hear. Okay. I, I can hear. Okay. I can hear. Yeah. So they restored the Statue of Liberty and they had this hundred year celebration and you might've seen that on TV and that's what got you started on that intro. Maybe. I know it was at some point because uh, when I did the intro, I mean, the, the production was, the show was in production. So we're, it took about a year to make the show. So we production actually started a year before the movie came out and I had heard about it like like I said, on television or something. Because mm -hmm. all three all three of us directors, it was myself, uh, Boyd Kirkland, and um, Frank Parr, we were like, you know, when I said, okay, we need an intro for G.I. Joe, go for it. Um, I, I, you know, it's like, I didn't have an idea until I saw that article. When, and that keyed me into to creating the uh, premise. I think my other, the other directors, they, they were all kind of struggling with what it could be. And we didn't want, you know, we didn't want another generic opening. So I think um, that's why everybody went with my Statue of Liberty because we had never done that before. And I also tried to make it interesting with new images and um, giving characters their air, you know, 
air, you know, uh, air time on the air like us, you know, characters we don't see very often. Mm -hmm. so I just put that we're in the kitchen sink. And the nice thing about it is that, you know, we had a theatrical budget on the intro, whereas on the TV show, they had a TV budget. So right. that helped a lot to, to make the quality of the work really well. Um, I think it's Duke or somebody, he's on a statue, he's shooting a machine gun like this, like uh -huh. this. It's all the pencil test. I mean, you guys can't see it, but the, it was gorgeous. It was like, because it was like, and all the shells are popping out and everything. Yep. So I, as an animator, I, I, I love seeing, I love seeing the work without color. Because then you can see yeah. everything, yeah. all the work that was done into the show. And that, God, I, I would love to see those. I would love to see those pencil tests. I wish so too. So yeah, I, I don't know what happened to them. <laughs> they're, they're, they're in a, uh, they're probably in a storage space somewhere outside of Los Angeles. Yeah. Ho hopefully climate controlled. I, I hope so too. Cause I, yeah, I've had the storage unit for a long time. Part of it was that, you know, when I, I, I guess I was just lazy. I just put it on a box. I, I finished a show, put it in a box and scoot it over there to work on another show. And then at the, you know, what am I going to do with these boxes? I don't want to go through them yet right now, so I just stick them in storage and just keep going. So yeah. Well, thank you. I come out so much stuff in storage. Thank you for saving them. Um, I'm sure <laughs> at, at some point, at some point, they'll be documented and make it out to the community and, and that type of thing. So thank you for saving that kind of stuff. I know a lot of people don't take the time and effort and pay the storage facility fees and, and everything that needs to be done. Um, it is a weird. It is a weird. It is a weird feeling that we all work in fields where the crap we bring home from work might be interesting to other people someday, right? Like, right. <laughs> um, so I want to return back to the Facebook questions real quick. We'll just kind of do a lightning round through those. You mentioned the okay. higher production budget of the film uh, compared to the TV series. Sunbow also created the television commercials that were marketing all these products. And sometimes the, the television production quality was very high um, through the roof. Oh, yeah. I, I was wondering yeah. what, were the same people that worked on the cartoon responsible in, in, in your role as a director, storyboarder, that type of thing? Were you, was, were, was the same team that did the TV cartoon also responsible for creating those TV commercials in parallel? Or was that a different group of folks? Or how did that relationship work? And in most cases, it was the same folks. When they would have a get a breather, they would do the uh, commercials. Mm -hmm. uh, a few times there, there was one artist, his name was George Good. He was pretty much dedicated to doing um, the uh, commercials. He was doing um, the G.I. Joe commercials and he was doing a show called um, Inhumanoids. Mm -hmm. Yes. He was, he was like the artist on both of those. And so um, when he needed help, uh, that's when people from the, our regular shows would go maybe grab a couple of commercials from him. But, we we're, were kind of all bouncing around. That's I mean, between in the '80s at at Marvel Productions. I mean, it was like they literally had. We had let's see. I think we had four studios. Or three stu no, I think we had three studios: Marvel One, Marvel Two, and Marvel Three, because we had so much work, and they were just it was filled to the brim with uh, employees working on all these shows from GI Joe and Transformers and Low Friends and, and Humanoids. And, and Bigfoot is a muscle machine. Um, uh, it was just like... Jim. Was, huh? Jim is her name. No one's the same. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so we just so, had tons of, work, tons of work coming out of it. But yeah, I think, yeah, we were kind of bounced between... George Goat was the main guy for the commercials, but, you know, um, it would bounce around. Sometimes the media would take some. Sometimes the Kohlberg. Um, yeah, so it, 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 it was, I guess the... The good fortune was was spread amongst everyone, and um, just to give you an idea, the the animation budget for a show was not not in America, but the show, but the budget that the overseas companies would get might have been about one thirty, one fifty per episode. Uh, a lot of times, the, a commercial, thirty second commercial would have would be like seventy five, but just by itself. So it was something that wow. the overseas would get because there's a ton of money in just 30 seconds and yeah. it's not that, yeah. much, you know, so the quality would be there. Two more quick questions, lightning around from the Facebook. Uh, who, so you worked on the movie, obviously the first 10 minutes. Do you remember the character big lob? Yes. Uh, he wore, wore a Jersey. <laughs> yeah. So do you, yeah. 
so he never appeared in toy form until like the collector club did it many, many years later. Um, do you remember the origin story of big lob, big lob? Because the rest of the like rookie recruits that were alongside him were actual toy characters that were developed by Hasbro and released in 1987. Do you remember maybe how big lob came about? Unfortunately, no, I wouldn't. I think uh, Buzz Dixon might know that better. I okay. had no hand in the creation of it, but um, sure. I remember that the director in charge of that section was uh, Boyd Kirkland, uh, okay. one of the Batman directors. But um, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, I don't have that information. Okay, and the, another question was about a character named Sparks that was created for the cartoon, but I'll, I'll assume it's probably the same answer. Um, yeah, a lot of the creation of the characters uh, I, I was not in, we were not involved in. That was actually right. the writing department because they That's dealt directly right. with, um, with the toy company. Uh, Ryan Drost had a question for Robert Atkins. Are you using your neighbor's Wi-Fi? <laughs> <laughs> um, I've, uh, I've been known to do that in the past when we were doing the podcast. Um, so me, me and Ryan, uh, well, Ryan's show, he, he does a podcast called Star Joe's and he's done it for years uh, that I've kind of guest hosted on a couple of times. And I was just known for having horrible Wi-Fi where we lived before and it's followed. Yeah, there it goes again. <laughs> yeah, no, good job. I, I, yes. And I think this is, this, is a good, this is a good representation of the rule, thou shalt not cover, covet thy neighbor's Wi-Fi. Look, we, we have Robert frozen again. We're getting ready to get Aww. second Robert here in a second. He's gonna, he's gonna rebalance the symmetry of the show. Um, okay. okay, so who wants, to, who wants to close out? Larry, I, you have been so patient with us. I know we've taken an hour and a half of your time. If you want to join wow. us again tomorrow night, seriously, open invitation. <laughs> we'll have you right back. Literally anytime we can send Tom home, it's fine. Uh, we always so, have a place for you here. You know, our feelings will not be hurt. We won't be destroyed. But if you want to join us again, we're doing it tomorrow night. We're closing out the mini series at 830. Um, cannot uh, I, thank you listen, enough. I, I, I'll, I'll be traveling. I'm going to hop in my car and head out to Southern California and just hit storage facilities looking for boxes <laughs> of G.I. Joe stuff. <laughs> oh my god my, my wife would love you because if you go if you, she wants me to get rid of those things i'm going i will dare you know if so i will i, will. I listen when it's safe to travel again i will come out there uh <laughs> i i will sleep in the storage space you, you, dibs, dibs. You, whatever you need <laughs> I, I don't know if you guys uh would want any copies of uh, some episodes i think i still have some yes. episodes on PDF. <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah absolutely yes, absolutely yeah uh so larry thank okay, you I, thank you so much for joining us really really appreciate it i i think robert will probably jump back on and and say thank you uh, as soon as he can get back on his waiver neighbor's wi-fi um <laughs> just shoot me a, pr a private message if you want to be on tomorrow night i'll shoot you a link again to the zoom meeting and okay. robert's back hey buddy so, this is a high-end uh, professional program i just um, want to remind everybody <laughs> did, did did any of our uh you know co-hosts did any of you guys have questions that you wanted to ask of larry before we cut him yes, free please good grief Okay. Um, right. I've been trying to ask this question for like the last 20 minutes. Um, my internet to crap again. I got to say, before we wrap up. Uh, it's so unfortunate. <laughs> we'll never know. We'll never know. Oh, man, it did lock up on him, didn't it? Robert Atkins' last words were, eh, 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 eh. I just want to know, my one question is, <laughs> Oh, uh, well, uh, what about you guys, Brandon, Tom? Uh, I, I'm just so tickled to have gotten to spend any time, and I, and I don't want to take up any more of your time than we already have, but thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, and when I say, you know, thank you for my childhood, thank you for where I am today. Uh, it, it's from the heart, and uh, I, I really hope to get to uh, shake your hand in person one day and give you a proper thank you. I hope to meet all of you someday. Once we can go back to being a regular, uh, at regular comic book conventions, it'd be cool. I could love to meet yes. you guys. Larry, do you, you know. have, you, know, the, you bring up a good point. Do you have any conventions? I'm obviously maybe second half of the year when we might actually be able to have conventions again. Are there upcoming appearances where people could try to meet you? Or also, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about what you're doing now, which is touching in. Yes. In, in on your early 20s passion of creating comic books, you finished three books back in the day, and now you're working on the continuation of that. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, 
the first question, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm scheduled to be at the San Diego Con, but I don't know <laughs> if, if he was going to make it or not. Um, so, you know, that's the, that's the last one I could think of. Um, so it may not be until next year when I go to another convention. Um, as far as the comic book, I'm work, I did a comic book uh, way back when. Uh, one was a book in the 70s called The Enforcers. And then in the 80s, I got a book published through uh, Charlton Comics called The Vanguards. And I remember so, that. Yeah. And, yeah. Oh, thanks. And now that I got retired, I went ahead and um, I put together um, The Enforcers into like one big graphic novel. It's on comicology right now. And uh, with the Vanguards, I've been working on a, a writing with all this time I got, I've uh, been working on a theatrical script for the Vanguardians. And I'm gonna try and get that when when things calm down. Um, it's uh, it's over at CAA right now. Um, nice. But everything's on hold, so I don't know what's gonna happen with it, but I'm gonna try and turn it into a theatrical film and I'll have some fun with it. And um, so that's what I've been working on right now. But, you know, with, when it, we know whenever they started, everything, you know, everything yep. hit the pause button. But yeah, I have an agent, yeah. and it, it's out there, so we'll see what happens. I want to try and um, bring back those characters. They were fun when I created it. Um, and um, I think I think kids will like it. I, I try, I, even drawing those characters even today um, still brings back a lot of like uh, my, um, my youthful enthusiasm for comic books. And I tried to infuse that into, the, into this uh, screenplay that I drew, uh, wrote, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's what you were uh, saying well, earlier. If the younger version of you would be excited by it and happy about it, then that's what you should push for. Yeah. Isn't that the guiding it, principle? Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, hopefully it'll, it'll transfer to someone, it'll transfer to, and someone else mm -hmm. will pick up on it. And that's like a lot of the films that I worked on, I try to do that in everything I work on is like I said, you know, I said earlier, if you can make the little kid in you excited about this, then, you know, maybe it'll, it'll inspire someone else down the line. And uh, I've been lucky that going to these different conventions, I've met uh, fans of G.I. Joe and X-Men that uh, with, they, they like the, inter the entertainment I was a part of was a was a cool part of their childhood, which I was really grateful that um, I was able to do that. I was able, I'm glad I was able to make a difference. I guess is the main thing. You you absolutely did. I yeah. hated I Pizza Hut growing up, and the only reason I went to Pizza Hut was to get your VHS cassettes of X Men the Animated Series. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, me, actually, me too. <laughs> if I can for, for just one minute. Um, so last week, uh, I found that the X Men was on Disney Plus. Now, I was in high school and college when the X-Men show was on, so I've actually never seen the 90s X-Men cartoon. What? So, Are you kidding yes, me? Yes, that's true. No, absolutely true. So uh, last week, my daughter and I spent part of a day last weekend and watched, I think, six episodes in a row. My daughter is nine years old. And mm -hmm. after we finished the first one, I said, what do you think? Do you want to do another one? Yeah, sure. Got to the end of that one? What do you think? One more? Oh, yeah. And so we spent, you know, a good part of our day watching that 90s X-Men show for the first time for me and the first time for her. And we both had a great time. And we're going to do it again this weekend. Oh, yeah. that's great. Yeah. Raising uh, them right. I'm glad to hear that. I, one, yeah. one, I yeah. can't believe uh, you took so long to see that. But, I mean, I got to say, again, before I cut out, hopefully, real quick, uh, Larry, I love you. <laughs> I don't want that to cut out. Okay, I got that in. All right, as long as that got in. Um, seriously, we talked in a previous episode how – um, you know, if you missed it on the day, like sometimes you could tape it on VHS eventually, but I remember Saturdays just being heartbroken that I missed the X-Men episode on that particular weekend. Like when I get asked, uh, when I get asked now, like what influenced you to do work or get into comics, I always say it was those 80s cartoons of G.I. Joe, uh, he Ninja Turtles, and then Transformers, and then going in with the X-Men, um, and just the variety of characters, how fluid the animation was, the, how strong the storytelling was, like that made me want to tell story as a professional, as an adult. Uh, so I, 
when I was a kid, that was just magic. It was just something I turned on my TV and it was there. I didn't know, right. I was naive. I mean, I was young. I didn't know that there were people working crazy hours to make this happen. And now that I'm older and a professional and I see the side of it, like you are a legend to me. <laughs> so I, I can now put like, the faces to the names that brought that magic when I was a kid. I, I can't say enough how much I appreciate you taking the time to, to do this and for all that you did. Yeah, uh, I, I appreciate the kind words. And I'm like I said, I'm glad that you guys were part of the show. You guys kept it on the air. And uh, I appreciate that um, we meant so much to you. In absolutely. And still do. And still yeah, do. Yeah, absolutely. I listen up, nerds in the audience. Uh, I want you to do a thing for me. This is not a, this is not a request. It's an order. I want you to go to Comixology, and I want you to get uh, I want you to get Enforcers. I want you to find anything with this man's name on it, and I want you to send the sales through the roof. You owe him that much. Show him love. <laughs> At the very least. Preach. There you go. Uh, Preach. I know you've already bought my books. Thanks, uh, Robert and and uh, Tom. I can't speak for, but I know my work is sold out. Go and just send the sales figures through the roof on Comixology. It's just not only the least you can do right now, it's the most you can do. So uh, just please do that uh, for our special guest. And uh, I am just, this is, I know we've done a lot of shows, as many as four, uh, but this is my favorite so far, I have to say. Uh, and I can't believe, Larry, that you watched us last night and then thought, well, I should be on that show. That's a, that's a brave decision. And we appreciate the hell out of it. Yep. I think that says a lot from just how bored Larry probably was. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. We caught him at the perfect time. <laughs> it was great listening to fans of, of the show. It was great. It's like y'all being in the same room together you know, with some of my buddies, too. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that's what we wanted this to be. So, again, thank you. Uh, you are our new old friend. <laughs> okay. Looks like I'm right. called, so I got I gotta go. <laughs> All right, guys. Okay. We will Thank we will you. be back at eight thirty tomorrow night. Thank you so much, Larry. If you'd like to join us, shoot me a PM. I'll shoot you a link. Uh, otherwise, everybody else watching, uh, we will be back here at eight thirty tomorrow night. Uh, please join us for the grand finale of the Mass Device. We'll talk with you guys soon. Cool. Thank you Thank again. You. He never gives up. He's always there, fighting for freedom over land and air. GI Joe. Okay. G.I. Joe is there.